I don't want no oil A spoil in my shoreline I like fish much better than crud I like birds and things A creeping and crawling Won't trade no more oil for blood The sun don't give us all we need To make this country run but that black demon oil's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. I don't want them nukes run by them kooks who think radioactivity is fun. No more three-headed frogs or kids with leukemia. Nuclear power ain't fit for a dog The sun don't give us all we need To make this country run But that nuclear power's got us Fussing and fighting And I do believe it's time we was done No news! Good morning, Toledo, and good afternoon, Columbus, and hello to everyone in Bowling Green or listening on the internet, wherever or whenever you may be. My name is Joseph D. DeMar, and I'm here with my quick-witted co-host, Rebecca Wood. For the next hour, we're going to be taking a look at the ecological state of the planet here on For a Green Future. The good news is it's quick. The bad news is it varies in quality. <laughs> Well, For a Green Future is a show where we talk about ecology and the environment, and we talk about them in the ways that they affect you, your wealth, your health, your happiness, and the wealth and health and happiness of your friends and family, as well as the ha health and happiness of the deciduous trees that are currently losing their leaves and dropping their needles right now, the hibernators like the Yellowstone grizzlies that are packing on the pounds eating salmon, the annual plants and insects that only live for one season that are dying by the trillions, the animals that store up food for the winter like beavers or bees, and the migrators, many of which are kind of milling about in confusion right now. Because no matter what your strategy is for coping with winter, and no matter if there will actually be a winter in the future or not, we're all stuck together on this rapidly changing planet called Earth. For the next 10 minutes or so, we're going to talk about some ecological observations we have, especially regarding the Yellowstone bison. Then we have a great returning guest, Colette Adkins, who is a fantastic lawyer with the Center for Biological Diversity. In kind of a follow-up to last week's show on predators, she's going to be talking to us about the importance of carnivores in ecosystems and the current efforts to throw us back into the 1950s in terms of our understanding of what of why predators are evil. That would make us uh, sort of evil, right? <laughs> if we want to oppose the predators that are supposedly yeah, evil. Good. We're, we're kind of predators, actually. <laughs> that's, that's right. At the bottom of the hour, we'll be hearing from our patrons and sponsors. And after that, we'll hear from Rebecca. Rebecca, what will you be talking to us about this week? I'm going to be call, talking about somebody called Alexandria Villasenor and uh, the, the campfire in uh, 2018, California. Fantastic. It's always good to hear about new activists on the scene. After we hear from Rebecca, it'll be ecological news from around the planet. We've got some, quote, gobsmackingly bananas news about global temperature, good news about sea turtles, and bad news about Lake Erie. And that'll be our show. This is a pre-recorded show, recorded on Thursday, October 12th, so you can't call in live, but you can call or text 419-973-5841, or send an email to foragreenfutureradio at gmail.com. We always love to hear from you. So res regular listeners to the show will remember that this is where we've been updating you, the public, about the situation of on the Canadian wildfires. That's because we don't believe in turning away from important environmental stories just because the national media has moved on. We reported last week that the wildfires had taken a huge jump 
roughly doubling to over 1,000 fires, with about 500 of those raging out of control. We'd like to report to you that the number of fires has dropped, or at the very least, we would like to accurately report anything to you. Unfortunately, we can't. That's because Canada has decided to stop updating its National Wildland Situation Report. Just like how COVID magically went away because we stopped I've, counting <laughs> I think that's a, a trend that Trump set. Yeah. Just stop counting the cases. Right. We keep counting the cases. All gone, problem solved. It's your imagination that your house just burned down. <laughs> this seems surprising and a little insane just as things are getting worse to stop giving people the vital information they need but you have to remember that the trudeau government is only pretending to be green a government that's locked into corrupt deals with fossil fuel companies can't afford to keep reminding people that global warming is real and that these fires are a direct consequence of fossil fuel use it's an inconvenient truth i it think the phrase is very all got to stop using fossil fuels or we're going to burn just like the Canadian forest. In much the way that a, a cannonball through the torso would be inconvenient. <laughs> <laughs> That's the direction we're headed. Yes. <laughs> Even as Canada's greenhouse gas emissions are ticking upwards from their lows during the pandemic, and even as Trudeau's government stops giving vital information about what's happening, he still has to appear concerned. So this past week, he visited several of the communities in Canada's Northwest Territories that have been ravaged by the fires. 70% of the Northwest, Northwest Territories population this year have been displaced by fires, including the Kettle Odichi First Nation. The Northwest Territories have an area approaching half a million square miles. The population was roughly 50,000 people before this summer's fires, he visited towns that were burned to the ground. In many places, only a fraction of the people have returned. Trudeau is actually very low in opinion polls right now, but elections aren't until 2025. He'll be seeking a record fourth term in 2025, so we'll see how his platform goes then. Let's hope he rebuilds some people's houses by then. <laughs> it's got a little time. Yeah. So the update we gave you last week, which was the official numbers as of September 29th, is the last comprehensive update we're going to be able to give you. We'll keep scanning the media for any reports we can find, but for the most part, the mainstream media has also decided to pretend that the catastrophe in the Canadian forests just isn't happening anymore. So more locally, the weather has definitely turned cooler and rainier around Northwest Ohio. Many studies have shown that it's hard to stay focused on global warming when it is cooler locally. In fact, studies show that just changing the temperature in the room where people are surveyed about global warming can change the responses on the survey entirely. Human beings, so smart, but so massively short-sighted. <laughs> What's that all about? We're very self-centered when it comes down to it, I suppose. Yeah, probably me too. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we change the temperature in this room and see how you feel? There we go. Yeah. <laughs> I think global warming has go gone away because I'm not hot. I need, I need a sweater. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> Even though it's gotten cooler in the local sense, it's still warmer than usual. Mm -hmm. There is still no sign of frost on the horizon, even though the average date for the first frost passed over a week ago. We have a story coming up in the news section that's going to talk about global temperatures in more detail. The point we want to make here is that even though there's so many ecological stories happening that it's impossible to respond to all of them, it's still important to pick a few and stick with them. The late, great Farley Mowat, who passed away in 2014, Yay, Farley Mowat. <laughs> before he died, said that everyone should find an area and defend it with everything they had. One of the areas we've stuck with over the past few years is the Yellowstone bison. Since they are the last genetically wild herd in the United States, they represent the best chance for returning wild bison to the prairies. So our producer, who must still not be named, spent the holiday, formerly known as Columbus Day, now called Indigenous People Day by many, reading and responding to Yellowstone's National Park's Draft Environmental Impact Statement, DEIS, for bison management. 
It's a depressing document with tons of repetition. The main part of the document is 99 pages, but without the unnecessary padding, it probably could have been 50. This might give you some idea for, of the lack of actual hard facts and data that it is supposed to rely on for its decisions. For more details about the overall effort, you can check our recent interviews with Stephanie C. from Rome Free Nation. However, there were a few impressions we wanted to share with you. It appears that the agency has shifted its focus on bison from preserving the bison's wildlife to supplying native hunters with meat. The park is even proposing to create terminal fields where they would truck captured buffalo into fields surrounded by native hunters who would then shoot the penned-in bison like fish in a barrel. And that's, a, that's an effort from the park itself. Another disturbing not actually super courageous. <laughs> no, I'm say. not a not a traditional yeah. honorable hunt like it used to be. Another disturbing thing in the DEIS is that twice bison are referred to as livestock. If these wild bison become domesticated livestock, Yellowstone National Park will have failed in its most basic mission. It's not actually supposed to be a big farm. No. <laughs> preserving. Or, or buffalo ranch. That's not its mission. The act of preserving wild wilderness requires preserving all the aspects of the ecosystem. That's botanic, hydrologic, geologic, and animal. If bison simply become cattle that are allowed to fatten up in the park before being slaughtered, the dream of returning truly wild animals to the landscape will have died. Back on March 7th, 1894, Congress passed an act to protect the birds and animals in Yellowstone National Park and to punish crimes in said park and for other purposes. They had a lot less pithy names back then. Yeah. The April 4th, 1894 House of Representatives report that accompanied this act states, quote, out of the vast herds of millions of buffaloes that a few years ago coursed the plains of America, a few hundred only remain, and they are now all in the Yellowstone Park. And one of the purposes of setting aside this park has been to preserve this little herd." End quote. It also indicates, accounts, that a few days ago poachers entered the park and commenced the slaughter of these animals. Prompt action is necessary, or this last remaining herd of buffalo will be destroyed. As a result, Section 4 of that 1894 Act established that, quote, All hunting, or the killing, wounding, or capturing at any time of any bird or wild animal except dangerous animals, when it is necessary to prevent them from destroying human life or inflicting an injury, is prohibited within the limits of said park, end quote. Clearly, the DEIS produced by Yellowstone, which relies heavily on killing, wounding, and capturing bison in order to control their numbers of their herd, violates what Congress very specifically prohibited back in 1894, with surprising foresight, I think. That was the, that was the peak of the buffalo hunting enterprise. So to try to, pa to actually pass legislation then, prevented them from continuing that practice. That's kind of amazing, really. I mean, you know, Teddy Roosevelt and the national parks and so forth, it's like they, they didn't under really understand the interrelationships of things in nature and how it affected the humans at all. They were just like, but it's pretty. Yeah. <laughs> That's all they were going on. And it's a good enough reason, actually. We'll have to wait and see what the reaction to the public comments are. There were tens of thousands of responses partially enabled by the fact that the comment deadline was extended. But right now it's impossible to say if those comments were from people who want to preserve the bison, the bison or ranchers who want them exterminated. The bison Yellow is biting you, you're too close. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I suppose if they, if they were actually <laughs> dangerous, that would be an interesting loophole. But mm -hmm. these are grazers, so... Yellowstone National Park must, going forward, try to incorporate these comments to the DEIS into a final environmental impact statement, which in turn will govern how the park treats its bison into the future. Our producer, in his comments, made the argument that the only rational course for the future is to allow the bison herd to reach the maximum 
capacity of the park, which according to the DEIS is 10,000 in the summer. Unfortunately, that rational course is not included in the park's plans. Right now, they plan to herd the, hold the herd to a minimum of 3,500 bison after calving and a maximum of five, six, or 7,000. That's too small by far. Department of Interior Environmental Services? No, that's the de, abbreviation for the... De, D-I-E-S. Why is it called dyes? The Draft <laughs> Environmental Impact Statement. I feel like it's ominous that it's called dyes. Dyes, <laughs> that's a good point. I wonder if that was a little... Yeah. <laughs> subterfuge. Every bison dies. <laughs> Another effect of keeping bison numbers low that the DEIS, the dyes, glosses over is the impact it will have on endangered species specifically predators. The report lists the endangered species in Yellowstone as grizzly bears, wolverines, Canada lynx, white pine, and monarch butterflies. Three of these are predators, and predators in general are having a hard time right now. Our next guest spends her career trying to protect predators from those that would otherwise malign them. Let's go to our interview with Colette Adkins. Hello and welcome to For a Green Future. Could you please share with us your name and title? Sure, I'm Colette Adkins. I'm the Carnivore Conservation Program Director at the Center for Biological Diversity. Uh, let's start with reminding our listeners about your organization. What does the Center for Biological Diversity do? And perhaps you could remind us of some of your past victories? Sure. Well, the the Center for Biological Diversity is a national nonprofit organization, and our mission is focused on protection of endangered species and their habitats. I work in the carnivore conservation program in particular, and I can share a couple of our recent victories that I'm I was involved in and I'm proud of. So. Um, one thing we've done is in Minnesota, where I live, we've gotten uh, strangulation snares banned or restricted in northeastern Minnesota wow. to protect uh, the Canada lynx, which is um, listed under the Endangered Species Act. And another recent one uh, deals with gray wolves. So um, we brought a lawsuit last year to try to get a national recovery plan for gray wolves. And the court um, this summer held that we are entitled to a national recovery plan rather than these regional plans that the that the Fish and Wildlife Service has been relying on. Sounds like you're keeping busy these days. We, yeah, I sure am. <laughs> we're getting emails all the time about species that are endangered that you're fighting for. What are some of those battles that you're fighting right now? Yeah, well, one of the most recent uh, lawsuits that I've filed, along with a colleague from North Carolina, is to try to protect the red wolf. The red wolf is one of the most endangered mammals in the in the world. There's only 13 known red wolves left in the wild. And we're trying to get the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to give the red wolf the highest level of protections. Unfortunately, it's too often that red wolves get shot or hit by cars, and we want more protections for their habitat and um, for the animals themselves. Where is their habitat? Is that also in Minnesota? Nope, that's in North Carolina. They actually were, so the gray wolf was found throughout most of the lower 48, except for southeastern United States. And that's where the red wolf uh, lived. And the red wolf is so imperiled that now they're only left uh, in eastern North Carolina in really just a few counties. Okay. So the reason we wanted to interview you this week is that last week we had a segment about the importance of predators in ecosystems. I think you have some expert in that expertise in that area. Could you just give us a quick recap about the role of predators in ecosystems? Sure. Well, I'm so glad to hear that you did a, a story on that. It's such an important public education piece, really, because we you know, decades ago, the thinking, even among some scientists, was that 
killing predators can be beneficial to boost populations of deer, for example, that hunters might want to kill. But um, current science shows that that really is backward and outdated thinking, that predators play an incredibly important ecological role that actually improves the health of the prey that they target by removing sick or weak or uh, injured animals. Additionally, predators um, really influence the behavior of the animals that they pursue. So for example, um, you know, in Yellowstone, like elk that would be sedentary and over browse an area. Or here in the in in the Midwest, there's a excellent research that areas where wolves are found have lower collisions between cars and deer because deer being afraid of wolves will seek um, shelter deeper in the forest rather than browsing on the forest's edge where roads are. Wow. So, you know, there's ecological importance to protecting predators, but there are even those economic and public safety benefits in terms of collisions with, with deer and other ungulates. And that's certainly a more recent thing, the role of predators to protect prey animals from humans. And oh, for sure. Didn't, didn't yep. happen in ancient history. Mm -hmm. Well, even as our understanding of the ecological importance of carnivores has grown, it seems like there's also a little bit of backlash to it. We saw a bumper sticker last week that said, save an elk, kill a wolf. Are you seeing an increase in that kind of language, this disinformation? How dangerous is it? Well, I do think that that disinformation is very dangerous, but I wouldn't say that there's been an increase. I do think that with, um, you know, modern communication tools, social media um, uh, in particular, the internet in general, there's a, it's, it's so easy to spread that misinformation. But I do think that, you know, most public surveys show that people you know, wolves in particular, grizzly bears too, um, that they, that people really love these animals. And even if they never get a chance to see one, they love the idea that they're out in the wild and that it makes wild places more interesting to, to visit, or even just to know that they're, they're out there. But for sure, there is still that, you know, that same anti-predator hostility that led to their the listing of some of these predators under the Endangered Species Act. Wolves and grizzly bears were targets of eradication campaigns because of that misinformation and, and hostility. And it does exist today, but I personally think it's getting better. That's good. Good to hear. Yeah. It also seems like hunters are increasingly being put into the forefront of environmental policy making. We've been covering the Yellowstone Monument uh, National Park's revised bison management plan, uh, and it clearly prioritizes creating hunting opportunities. Does prioritizing hunt hunters in legislative terms hurt environmental policies? Well, it is a problem that too often the decision makers about wildlife management are hunters or uh, folks that that really think of hunters as their clients. So mm -hmm. for example, you know, natural resources boards or wildlife commissions are often politically appointed positions, often under state lots, even required that they have, they hold a hunting license, for example. But of course, more than just hunters care about the way our wildlife is managed. Um, bird watchers like myself, you know, hikers, campers who just want to be out and enjoy wildlife without killing them should have a say in how wildlife is managed. So that is, uh, you know, that kind of focus on wildlife being a commodity that should be managed for the benefit of hunters is for sure an ongoing problem. But I think with the um, you know popularity uh, of you know sports like bird watching, you know that really that is changing that dynamic. And uh, when when people that enjoy wildlife alive and free in the wild speak up, um, participate in these you know public comment periods and hearings that usually would be just filled with an audience of hunters, I think slowly over time will make a difference in terms of changing the value sets of the decision makers. That'd be that'd be good to hear. 
that'd be good to uh, see in legislation, the prioritization of hobbyists as opposed to hunters. Well, and a lot of it comes down to the funding as well. And that's part of the one of the obstacles to change is if wildlife management decision makers are being there, if their funding comes solely from uh, license fees and tag fees, it's hard for them to think beyond that for for, you know, a, a bird watcher or a hiker or someone who doesn't pay that type of fee. It, it becomes almost a business transaction, which isn't, you know, that the, it which shouldn't be driving our values or our science. Speaking of Yellowstone, we learned a lot when the wolves were reintroduced into that ecosystem, didn't we? That oh, was a my huge goodness. opportunity. Yeah, we learned so much and it's it's almost, you know, created like a almost like mythical proportions when you hear, you know, those amazing videos of how even the rivers have been transformed by wolves. <laughs> I mean, that that for sure is such an amazing example. But there are, you know, less less showy but still significant examples in Wisconsin, for example, there's really good research showing that as um, wolves came back to Wisconsin, that uh, the the composition of the plants in the forest changed. And we got back to these uh, like uh, like uh, spring ephemerals, like wildflowers that normally would have been browsed and um uh, by deer, if deer um, are kept at, you know, ecologically sustainable levels because of the role of predators, you do get a richer plant environment, which then affects all sorts of other species. Do you think we're approaching a, a deeper understanding of the, the effect of natural predation as opposed to human-led, you know, culling of herds type of thing? I think it's well established now that we don't need people to <laughs> to do those types of management, especially of predators themselves. I mean, you still will hear people saying things like, oh, you know, like the wolves would take over if we didn't shoot them. I mean, that doesn't make any sense at all. They're defined, you know, their populations are limited by disease, territoriality. Um, and even with, you know, species like deer, I mean, I remember growing up and hearing people saying, oh, well, if we didn't have hunters, uh, then deer would would take over. But then learning in my wildlife management courses, oh, that actually deer are managed at higher levels than the ecosystem can support for the benefit of hunters. And right. then to hear hunters complaining about competition with wolves, it, you really can't have it both ways. You, and what the science shows is that animals are regulated by all sorts of factors, predators, of course, but also, you know, climate, availability of food, other factors. I mean, humans themselves, other than hunting, are huge stressors on, on wildlife species in terms of collisions with cars or habitat destruction, et cetera. So what attracted you to protecting carnivores? They're, they're fierce animals. They have to be. But they're kind of vulnerable themselves, aren't they? Oh, they are for sure. I mean, really, I grew up in Minnesota. I've, you know, ever since I was in elementary school, I'd go up in the summers to the Boundary Waters to go canoeing and hiking and always wanted to get a glimpse of a wolf. A few times growing up, I heard a wolf howl, but never saw one in person. It was such an allure. It really, this idea of like, the wild. And I think there is something that is that wolves symbolize that just is, yeah, just wild and free and beautiful. And really, I they are such amazing family creatures. They have, you know, they've got this amazingly elaborate social structure where they take care of each other, really, like a family should. And we know we know canids because we live with them. We invite them into our homes as dogs and we know how smart and and social and loving and loyal they can be. And there's no reason to think that wolves in the wild don't share those same characteristics. And I think uh, that that they deserve to be treated better than they are. And, and I'm glad to be able to play a role in that. What would you say to someone who has fallen into the mindset that carnivores are evil and should be eradicated? Uh, you know, it's really hard to change 
people's values, especially just through a conversation. And that's a, a really good point you've already made that, you know, canids, yeah. we know canids. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, you know, I honestly, I hardly ever like with adults, I hardly ever even try to con- con- change that value set. I think it is very difficult because people will just find the information that supports their, their own backwards thinking. But I do think there's a lot of hope in terms of talking to kids who, who I think are born with a love of animals that only get sort of destroyed over time <laughs> through influences of, of people that maybe share those types of anti, um, anti, carnivore or anti-animal type um, mentality. Well, thanks so much for joining us here on For a Green Future. Could give us your information again, how to contact you. Sure. Well, I really appreciate you having me on. Yeah, my name is Colette Adkins. You can find me on the webpage, meet the staff at the Center for Biological Diversity. Do you have any final comments for our listeners? Well, I think, you know, if they really want to speak out for wolves, um, now is a great time to do so. Wolves or grizzly bears. uh, If there's something in like an article, like a newspaper article that puts forward that kind of anti-predator viewpoint, I encourage folks to write their own letters to the editor and try to, um, the more people that speak up for these animals, I think that's slowly how public attitudes will change. All right. Thanks again. Nice to speak with you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Well, we hope you found that interview enlightening. We certainly cheer on Colette and everyone at the Center for Biological Diversity who too often these days find themselves the last line of defense for many different creatures. Now, let's hear from our sponsors and patrons. For a Green Future is also brought to you by the Wood County Park District. The Wood County Park District is a natural resources conservation agency. They protect natural spaces, maintain quality green spaces, provide engaging programming, and they teach people to love and respect nature. They also restore wildlife habitats and lead people on outdoor adventures. Wood County Parks protects natural spaces in Wood County for all to enjoy from 8 a.m. to 30 minutes past sunset every day of the year. There are several ways to get a hold of them and find out what's happening. One is to call them at 419-353-1897. Another is to visit their website, www.wcparks.org. The website, again, is at www.wcparks.org. They are also available on all social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and many others. Just search for WC Parks. That's the Wood County Park District, and we're very grateful for their support. Thanks for listening to that message from our sponsors and patrons. Okay, Rebecca, you're turn at the mic. What do you have for us this week? Okie dokie. Well, uh, I believe within the next week or so, uh, uh, Hispanic Awareness Month, uh, Hispanic Heritage Month, Hispanic Heritage Month is going to be wrapping up. Uh, like it's over on the 15th? I don't know. I think it's like September 15th to October 15th or something weird. I guess that's technically a month. Yeah. It's a little weird. It's not really. It's like a month that was made out of two months I, it, it, it violates my sense of order anyway um <laughs> yeah so instead of just reading off the list again i kind of wanted to uh talk about one person a little bit uh so this is somebody i got off of a list given by somebody called clean choice energy so right away i'm thinking major uh major energy company oh. probably using this 
article is greenwash. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm cynical. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, this this uh, person, Alexandria Villasenor, is an 18 year old second generation Mexican American who was uh, became interested in, in the environment after experiencing the campfire in 2018. Uh, I'm assuming she uses she. I'm not sure. She's the founder and and uh, board president of something called Earth Uprising, and was a a named petitioner in the uh, Children versus Climate Crisis petition that was uh, of you know, one of 16 people that pre- that filed this petition with the United Nations. Also, she has an essay which I would encourage people to read if they can find it in a, a book of. Um, Essays by female ecologists uh, that are sort of upbeat and inspirational called All We Can Save, which sounds pretty good. It, okay, so being me, you know, easily distracted, I got interested in the campfire because I remember that from a while back. Yes. Yeah. But yeah, I wanted to have an idea of, you know, sort of what she experienced. Uh, the campfire was named after Camp Creek Road in Butte County, California, which is Northern California, north of Sacramento. Uh, deadliest and most destructive wildfire in California's recorded history in terms of insured losses. Hmm. And probably other factors, too. But. Yeah, so I would say, you know, uh, again, that that, that's, that says as much about how much Butte County people have, in, how much insurance they can afford as anything. Right. But it, it's it's Central Valley. It's probably mostly farmers. But then again, you got some corporate farming, so they've probably got good insurance. Anyway, it was destructive. Um, it went on from, it did sixteen over $16 billion worth of damage, I believe was the figure. And it went on from uh, November 8th through the 25th of 2018. Burned 240 square miles, was caused by an electrical transmission fire from a power line from P&G, not, not a... Uh, Clear Choice Energy. <laughs> right. I checked. pg e pg e Yeah, okay. Um, and over 18,000 buildings were destroyed. There were 85 deaths, 19 non-fatal injuries, which, you know, that can include maimed, uh, disabled, n- lungs never going to be the same. Yeah. <laughs> so, non-fatal you know, injuries. There's a lot of wiggle room. Yes, there is. And one person missing. So I don't know, you know, possibly this girl did, just did not enjoy having her house burned down or uh, running away from a giant wall of flame looking out the back of the, the, the car window. And yeah. That. Uh, or, you know, but I wanted to find out a little bit more about Butte Cal- County, County, California, you know, where this happened. Um it's north of Sacramento, the Central Valley, and it, it has some nice stuff there. They have something called Upper Bidwell Park, uh, the Lake Oroville State Recreation Area that has the Oroville Dam in it, and uh, I think it's a Feather River, not sure. And also North Table Mountain Ecological Reserve in Oroville, or in or near Oroville, California. Uh, according to the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, it's known for... Uh, the North Table Mountain Ecological Reserve is nor- known for its really gorgeous uh, spring wildflower displays. And also it has something called North Basalt Flow Vernal Pools, which I had never heard of. Uh, but NatureServe Explorer, sa- or NatureServe Explorers possibly, uh, says they are shallow ephemeral water bodies, um, usually less than 50 square meters across. And they uh, they happen a lot in Northern California and also the Columbia River Gorge along the Washington Oregon border. Uh, they're located over basalt, bedrock, and a thin layer of soil usually. And uh, in, in a lot of cases, like you know, they just kind of if the basalt is permeable, they seep in. But for these ones, uh, if it's impermeable, then they kind of last for a little bit and mm-hmm. slowly evaporate. But a uh, bunch of it's it's got a pretty unique um, ecosystem, I guess. Maybe not all organisms that are just in the in these pools, but uh, it's it's kind of a unique combination that that I uh, I looked some of them up. There's Blenosperma nanum, which is a fish. Sounds unique. Yes, it does. Yeah, the blenny fish they're called. Um, Epilo, Epil. Oh boy, Epilibium densiflora, which is a type of willow herb, which are called that because they have willow-like leaves, apparently. Uh, Colantrich marginata, which is a 
water starwort, a water starwort, and Secenda quadrilangaris, I think, which is some kind of herb or flower, also called the Oregon timwort. It's yellow. I saw a picture. They're kind of pretty uh, and native to California. So, I, well, the, you know, the burning might in the short actually help the wildflowers. Yeah. Probably the vernal Foliage pools can... might not be so vernal if all the trees burn down, though. So that's a problem, you know. <laughs> yeah. During the fires, I'm sure those were bone dry. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of, you know, some things that were at stake. And also humans, you know, <laughs> it, it could just, boil. I don't even know if she knows about this stuff. Could be it just boils down to, gee whiz, this global warming thing is a problem because it seems to have, you know, destroyed my entire community. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and made me a refugee. <laughs> So yeah, that that is uh, Alexandria Villa Senor. All right, thanks, Rebecca. Uh, on to our ecological news section. We're starting with the story that I'm sure Alexandria has paid attention to, from theguardian.com. It's about the record levels of high temperatures this past summer. This was the hottest September on record, and it followed the hot hottest August and the hottest July as well. And if you're tired of hearing about this kind of story, about the high temperatures that we've been seeing, we suggest you start doing something about it. Yep. Because if we don't force societal change soon, every summer from now until humanity's climate extinction will be the hottest summer on record. Make us stop. We dare you. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't throw us in that briar patch. This past September in 2023, absolutely shattered records, rising half a degree Celsius over the previous heat ceiling, and almost two degrees Celsius over pre-industrial levels. That's before 1940 or so. And that brings us around to Zach Hausfather at the Berkeley Earth Climate Data Project. Quote, September was, in my professional opinion as a climate scientist, absolutely gobsmackingly bananas. <laughs> I think it's, it sounds humorous, but I think it's a little scary. Uh, if a plumber came into your house and looked at your pipes, <laughs> or if a doctor looked at your chart and described it as absolutely gobsmacking <laughs> bananas, I think you'd be a little worried about what's going on. Wow, right? it's nuts what's going on with your liver. Yeah, that's not good. <laughs> Same with any other kind of science. But society, or maybe the media, has almost normalized these climate disaster data points. It's just another figure to be spooked about. But it's not normal. Mika Rantanen, climate researcher at the Finnish Meteorological Institute, has said, quote, I'm still struggling to comprehend how a single year can jump so much compared to previous years. Professor Ed Hawkins at the University of Reading, UK, has said, even this summer is not typical of a plus 1.5 degree Celsius post-industry society. Samantha Burgess at the EU's Copernicus Climate Change Service said these September temperatures were, quote, unprecedented and have broken records by an extraordinary amount. Even the uh, country known for hot climates, Joel, Ger Joel Gurgis, climate scientist in Australia, says the figures are shocking. What they're seeing here is the result of continuing high levels of carbon dioxide emissions in the atmosphere. In other words, it's a... Positive feedback loop. And as with any such system, there's every indication <laughs> it'll just continue to get worse. In fact, it'll get significantly worse next year specifically as we switch over to an El Nino event. The La Nina El Nino cycle describes the really incredible natural phenomenon of how global weather patterns alternately cause the storing of temperature in the ocean and subsequent release of the excess temperature. We could do a whole segment on that, and we probably will sometime in the future. At the beginning of next year, 2024, the world is set to transition into our new El Nino event. It's impossible to say how long these events last, but it's been a couple years each previous cycle. It'll certainly be long enough to set records high next summer. And after all the stunned testimonials of experts from this year, they might just be speechless this time next year. There's, uh, there's so many people, so many experts and scientists 
screaming out into the void that the entire planet is dying. Basically, We've whole countries are at this it. point burning down. Yeah. You know, I think it's just a matter of time before it, it gets to, well, Ohio, you know? It's always closer than you think. Yeah. yeah. Hawaii is one of the 50 states. Yeah. You can't forget that. Yeah. A shorter story now that takes us to the coasts of Florida for a positive result from our planet's warmer temperatures. From weather.com, record sea turtle nests in Florida point to recovery hope for the species. More than 200,000 sea turtle nests have been counted this year, with green turtle nests numbering more than 40% over the previous record in 2017. Interestingly, there's a significantly higher percentage of females reported than previous years, up to 100% female from some nests. Marine scientists suggest that a higher proportion of females is a result of warmer ocean temperatures. That's probably a good thing, since female turtles can lay up to 100 eggs and each up to nine times a year. But we won't know the full ecological impact for a long time, since it takes more than 20 years for them to reach sexual maturity. And if you, there's several, well, okay, yeah, they, they live to be like 100, though, right? Sea turtles? But still, yes. too many generations of all females is going to be a problem eventually. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have to check back in a few decades to see if the massive ways of females has had a significant positive impact on their endangered status. I think it just serves as a little reminder as to how the planet will survive without humans, even if we yep. cause ourselves extinction. If only we didn't take a whole bunch of other species with us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We have uh, another positive story here on that topic, actually, from earthjustice.org. Back on September 26th, President Biden vetoed two proposed bills from Congress to remove Endangered Species Act protections for the Lesser Prairie Chicken, very important species, and the Northern Long-Eared Bat. This was the latest in a long chain of one-off legislative attacks to weaken the Endangered Species Act, one critter at a time. Previously, wolves, bears, whales, and other birds and bats have all been specifically targeted by the Congressional Review Act. A CRA resolution has the power to void specific regulations and simultaneously prevent future issuances of a rule that is substantially the same. In other words, if any of these single species assassination bills passes, the Endangered Species Act would be prevented from protecting any animals in the future. So they're kind of going after uh, the sort of the, the species that there's a fair amount of uh, negative fo folklore a lot because they're the weak link. Yeah. That's I mean, how they, they remove protections for all species by going, uh, going after the unpopular critters. Right, yeah. It means that the very practices of animal conservation and preservation are under attack constantly by Republican and lobbyist-led efforts to make more territory available for pollution and industry. Kind of like how the first victim of the, the witch burnings is some sort of unpopular old uh, poverty-stricken old lady with warts, you know, who lives at the edge of the village and mumbles and is cranky. First they came for the witches. <laughs> yes. And then the prairie chickens. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's the order, right? Witches and prairie chickens. Uh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, uh, a successful defense of one of the most important tools for protecting ecosystems and promoting bio biodiversity. And it's also just in time to celebrate the Endangered Species Act's 50th year anniversary coming up in December. Since 1973, it has saved 99% of protected species from extinction and preserved millions of acres of habitats countrywide from incursion. You can contrast the federal protections that the United States gives endangered species with the subject of our next story. Canada has rejected a request to protect the habitat of the northern spotted owl. The Wilderness Committee Environmental Advocacy Group and the Canadian Environmental Minister have begged the Canadian Cabinet for an emergency halt to logging efforts in the Spoosum, Spoosum Nation Territory, as well as an additional 6,200 acres of forest habitat. This is all happening in southwest British Columbia, where, before industrial logging began, 
there were almost 1,000 spotted owls recorded. Now only one wild-born owl remains, and the efforts to release captive red owls back into the wilderness are, for the most part, failing. Canada has what's called the Species at Risk Act, which dr differs dramatically from the direct regulatory protections of the Endangered Species Act. The Species at Risk Act was created in 2002 and provides guidelines for an, an independent body to nominate a species for a kind of financial adoption or stewardship by private or public entities. In other words, it provides incentives for corporations or nonprofits to protect at-risk animal populations on their own terms. In the case of the northern spotted owl, apparently those incentives are not sufficient to prevent their extinction. I mean, it's no wonder that logging companies don't care about the native animal populations. If they did, there wouldn't be logging. You probably don't remember, like, the, I think it was the 80s. There was, like, all this contempt directed at spotted owls. Like, oh, we can't log because it's, it's, it's just some stupid bird. It's just a, oh, it's just a spotted owl. It's so dumb, you know. Um, yeah, it was like, they, but, but okay, you know, the, this is coming from a mentality that, oh, you know, it, it's, it's always just just nonsensical and contemptible to to protect a non-human from anything yeah it, and that we're our, our 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 destiny is completely divorced from the rest of nature somehow we're so special you know it assigns no moral valuable value to any animal's life when well, where, you, where do you where do you draw the line oh it's just a bird oh it's just a grizzly bear oh it's just this it's just it's just it's just the whole planet you know it's just the whole planet that's burning down because you know we, we we couldn't protect the owls because you know that was stupid to protect just a bird so you know at, at what point does it become but important you it's know every bird. <laughs> yeah it's every animal unfortunately the only power that the species at risk act has to directly, you know, stop corporations from logging the spotted owl is in the form of emergency order requests. And it's exactly that action which has now been denied. The Wilderness Committee, represented by EcoJustice, will have one last showing in court on October 18th. But failing a successful plea by, for the northern spotted owl, it's very likely that species will go extinct in the wild. You know, I think Americans have a sense of Canada being a very wild, wilderness-friendly place. But I guess the love of money is the root of all evil. Pretty much. Canadians like, Canadian politicians like cash, too, it turns out. <laughs> Sorry, that's cynical again. I'm being cynical. <laughs> yeah. I mean, from a financial perspective, it's easy. But or realistic, you, as some people like to call it. <laughs> when you threaten the extinction of an entire species for the very logs of its house, house you don't really have solid ground to stand on from a moral perspective yep back on september 28th the united states environmental protection agency approved a controversial plan to reduce the amount of phosphorus flowing into the maumee river and ending up in lake erie this is in an effort to stop or slow the creation of algal blooms which have been an annual concern on lake erie's shores for years yep the original plan was proposed by the Ohio Environmental Protection Agency and establishes a total maximum daily load, TMDL, on all sources of phosphorus entering the Maumee River from the Maumee watershed. The controversy seems to stem from the TMDL's setting of suggested limits of the overall load of phosphorus as opposed to focusing specifically on total dissolved phosphorus, which causes the algal blooms much more readily. It also appears there's a little political maneuvering at play. The main source of dissolved phosphorus is from agricultural runoff, and the Ohio EPA's plan ties directly into Governor Mike DeWine's H2 Ohio plan, or what he claims is a collaborative approach to the issues facing Ohio's water. That is a voluntary plan, which has yet to see major progress be made on water qu <coughs> quality, as significant effort is being made to avoid changing Ohio's agricultural industry. We had a look at the Ohio EPA's TMDL plan, and it did have some language towards restricting dissolved phosphorus as well as, cap as, well as capping total phosphorus. But unfortunately, it does not mandate the limits there. It only has a suggested maximum or dissolved phosphorus load. So we'll just have to wait and see.
and luckily, or unluckily, I suppose, the results of this plan will be easily verifiable by the public. We'll be able to directly observe any change in the annual algal blooms in the years to come. I read something once about, uh, it, was, it was a travel guide to Mexico, a slightly irreverent one, and, and one of the ones was a warning, if you're driving in Mexico, remember that a stoplight or a stop sign in Mexico basically means, well, the the, the least manly person should probably, you know, oh, lose the chicken fight. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's someone should probably stop. You know, that's how they're basically regarded and treated in, in, in there by a lot of people, and and uh, it's kind of the same deal with the. Uh, you should sort of consider maybe not, you know, killing yeah. us all thing. The Ohio EPA <laughs> with these regulations, yeah. The EPA is playing a game of chicken with the public's health and seeing how far they can push those limits. Yeah. Basically, they are super macho apparently because they're not stopping. <laughs> For our last story from TheGuardian.com, we have a real ecological tragedy. Last week, over 1,000 birds died in a single day by colliding with a single building in Chicago. Their migration south ended at McCormick Place, the largest convention center in North America, and almost entirely covered in reflective glass. And this figure is just the estimate obtained from collecting and counting their actual corpses. This issue of tall reflective buildings causing the death of birds has been known about since, well, we've had tall buildings. According to the American Bird Conservancy, up to a billion birds die each year from collisions, with a significant portion being in Chicago and New York City. Most likely, this innocent group of birds was migrating from Canada down to South and Central America. But the most upsetting thing about this is that we already know how to prevent, or at least dramatically lessen, bird deaths from collisions. A study done back in 2021 at McCormick Place, the same building we're talking about, found that shutting off half the lights in large buildings can make collisions between 6 and 11 times less likely. And legislation has even been passed to try to limit these needless bird deaths. In 2020, the city of Chicago approved bird-friendly design ordinance that has yet to be mandated. And in 2021, the state of Illinois and the city of New York both started requiring new construction and renovation of of buildings to have bird-friendly design, but there are many existing buildings that continue to take their toll on the passing migratory bird flocks. This has been an issue for so many years, and we're so close to an answer. We just need that final legislative push, that next mandate, and hopefully we'll be able to leave this senseless bird death far behind us. Well, that'll be it for our show this week. As always, you can leave questions, comments, or corrections with 419-973-5841 or email us at foragreenfutureradio at gmail.com. I don't want no oil a spoil in my shoreline I like fish much better than crud I like birds and things A creeping and crawling Won't trade no more oil for blood The sun don't give us all we need To make this country run But that black Demon oil's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. I don't want them nukes run by them kooks who think radioactivity is fun. No more three-headed frogs or kids with leukemia. Nuclear power ain't fit for a dog. The sun don't give us all we need to make this country run. But that nuclear power's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. 
No, no, no. no.